Uh, 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 shoot! Sorry, thinking about this movie has made me feel a bit sick lately. <coughs> I'll take some pills and maybe then I can tell you all about it. <clears throat> okay, Osmosis Jones is probably one of the more obscure animated films of the early 2000s, produced by Warner Brothers Feature Animation, right between The Iron Giant and Looney Tunes Back in Action, the movie offered an exciting blend of both animation and live action, similar in style to Space Jam or Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Except instead of having the animated characters interact with real people, Osmosis Jones was more about creating two different worlds, the one outside your body and the one inside your body. The results were interesting, to say the least. Despite the bizarre premise boasting a big-name actor like Bill Murray, Osmosis Jones failed to perform at the box office in the States, grossing only $13 million. As for the UK, well, I know that it had a theatrical release because there's a British poster for it, but there's no box office information on the film whatsoever, so either the movie performed so badly that there's no record of how well it did, or there's a bit of a hole in the archives somewhere. So the movie might not have gone viral in the cinema, but to be honest with you, Osmosis Jones was always kind of a cult thing with kids over here. This movie was one of my first ever DVDs when I was about six, so it goes a long way back for me. And I remember we even used to play Osmosis Jones on the school playground. You know, like when you run around pretending to be the actual characters. Yeah, that happened. Still, it wouldn't be coming soon without a VHS, so let's take a closer look at Osmosis Jones and see if we can get through it without getting infected. First up, trailers. We start off with one for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which, to be honest, is probably how I first heard of Harry Potter in the first place. You're a wizard, Harry. I'm a what? In fact, I remember seeing these trailers and not having a clue what the plot was about. Dear Mr. Potter, we are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Through the dungeon! Understand this, Harry, because it's very important. Not all wizards are good. I'm going to bed before either of you come up with another clever idea to get us killed. Or worse, expelled. She needs to sort out her priorities. Yeah, it was like an assault on your senses back then, but it did make me want to pick up the movie from the video shop, so that's something. The last trailer is for, well, what do you think it is? Throughout the ages, there has been one hero standing watch over us all. One hero protecting mankind wherever he is needed. It's dark, it's foreboding, the narrator means business. Surely this has to be a trailer for the greatest superhero of all time. Scooby-Doo. Oh, really? This has to be one of those classic teaser trailers. I always liked it when trailers would try to fake you out like this, since it just made them more memorable somehow. One of those rare cases where the trailer is probably better than the film itself. But that's it for the trailer, so let's get stuck into the movie. Actually, it's interesting to note that on the VHS, it's a slightly alternate cut of the film, where the music is different in some places. Like on the DVD, you can hear this early 2000s hip-hop track at the start. But on the VHS, it's a piece taken from the musical score. Just a minor difference, but it does make me wonder why. Maybe it was because of music royalties or something. Anyway, the movie starts off in the live-action realm with the introduction of Frank, a zookeeper played by Bill Murray, who doesn't look after himself and acts very disgusting. And that's pretty much his entire character. Dad, that's filthy. Honey, 10 second rule. It's the ground, you pick it up within 10 seconds, you can eat it. Scene after scene is dedicated to nothing but gross-out gags and toilet humour, which you can probably put down to the directors, the Farrelly brothers, 
Perhaps best known for Dumb and Dumber and There's Something About Mary, which feature a similar style of comedy, only Osmosis Jones takes it to another level, so this isn't the best movie to eat your lunch with. Thankfully, there's so little to say about the live-action section of the film that we can move on to the star of the show, the animated portion. Once Frank swallows an infected egg, we're taken right down his windpipe and into his body, which is structured like an actual city, with germs as the criminals and white blood cells as the cops who have to catch them. Oh, you have entered the city of Frank. Put your hands up and surrender for nature. You can tell they put a lot of effort into designing all this, like having arteries as roads or the mayor running everything from the brain. It's very creative, but it does create something of a contrast with the live-action segments. Maybe you can put that down to a clash of styles, as while the Farrelly brothers directed the icky Bill Murray stuff, all the animation was directed by a completely different duo, Piet Kroon and Tom Sito, both of whom had extensive animation backgrounds. In fact, the animation was completed prior to the Farrelly brothers or Bill Murray ever being involved, so basically all the live-action stuff was just slotted in later, once the studio found the right people they wanted for the job, which would explain why one portion seems more developed and engaging than the other. It's here we're introduced to our hero, Osmosis Jones, voiced by Chris Rock. Yo, you see this badge? You see this gun? You see this gooey white sack of membranes around my personhood? Well, you're dealing with a white blood cell here! He's a wise-cracking cop who has the nifty ability of being able to morph into all kinds of different shapes, and he's been assigned to clean up all those nasty mouth germs. But when they hijack a car and Ozzy accidentally shoots down a nerve receptor, he gives Frank a cramp and ends up in hot water with the chief. Told you to stay put! I told you to wait for backup! But once again, you had to do it your own way! If you couldn't tell already, this movie follows the classic buddy-cop formula right down to the letter. Almost like a biology-themed lethal weapon, I guess. It even has a corrupt mayor, voiced by William Shatner, of all people, who decides to control Frank's thoughts so he can make his health issues seem not as bad as they are. Sir, you can't go into override without a vote from city council. <laughs> his assistant Leah, voiced by Brandy, best known for her singing career, tries to stop him, but it's no good, and he orders Frank to take a cold pill. On, on second, second thought. thought. On second thought. Perhaps I'll take a cold pill. Perhaps I'll take a cold pill. Talk about hearing voices in your head. Anyway, this means Ozzy has assigned a new partner down at the stomach, which is like the arrival section at an airport. This is where we're introduced to Drix, voiced by David Hyde Pierce, being cast somewhat against type in the muscle role here, which is kind of amusing. Drix and all, the brand that eases your coughs and sneezes. Warning, do not exceed recommended dosage. If symptoms persist, consult a physician. And remember when I said that sometimes we'd pretend to be the characters in school? Well, everyone always wanted to be Drix. Why? Because he has a big gun on his arm, and anyone who has a big gun on their arm is just automatically the coolest character. Though speaking of cool, once the rest of that mouldy egg finally cracks open, we get our first look at Thrax, the villain of the movie, played by Lawrence Fishburne. Careful, I'm contagious. And I'll cut straight to the point, Thrax is just plain cool. His voice is amazing, he can use his cape to glide like a bat, and he has a giant claw on one hand that just boils you up until you explode. Ow. <laughs> 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 uh, more kids' movies need scenes like this. Thrax's goal is to be the best virus and kill Frank in record-breaking time, so he starts a sore throat to make it seem like a common cold, and Drix uses that big gun of his to cool down the situation. Seriously, that thing is cool. Can you believe there was a toy of this guy and it was never released? Sadly, Drix also freezes the only witness to Thrax's crimes, giving him time to recruit some other germs to his cause. They refuse, of course, but Thrax takes it pretty well. <laughs> wow, whatever happened to PG animated movies like this? I know they'd say it's too violent now, but this was like the best bit if you were six. Thrax's next cover-up is to start a runny nose by breaking the snot dam, so we get a lovely scene of Ozzy and Drix getting sucked into all kinds of slime and mucus. I joke that this is the kind of scene that brings the two partners closer together, but it actually does, with Ozzy revealing some of his backstory about how he got such a troubled reputation as a cop. You did something terrible, didn't you? Drifts. Sometimes being too careful is all it takes. Turns out Frank actually used to be a stand-up guy, but when he ate some bad oysters at his daughter's science fair, Ozzy had to push the panic button to stop germs from getting in, causing Frank to throw up all over a teacher, who probably has some kind of issues of her own if this scene is anything to go by. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> 
Either way, Frank became a laughing stock and turned into the slovenly beast we see now. Moving on from that touching origin story, one of Ozzy's informants gives the duo a lead to a nightclub that takes place inside a throbbing zit, just in case this movie isn't gross enough for you already, but it does lead to one of the best songs in the film, Daddy Cool. Yeah, you can tell this whole sequence is pretty much an ad for the soundtrack, which failed to chart anywhere, but Ozzy manages to disguise himself and snag a meeting with Thrax and his henchmen, where Thrax reveals that he plans to steal a DNA bead from Frank's mind that controls all the temperature in his body, so he can kill him and break his previous record. I'm gonna take him down in 48 hours! Get my own chapter in the medical books! He even keeps a necklace with these things. That'd be like a serial killer hanging onto the eyeballs of all his victims. When Ozzy gets caught though, Drex tries to help but ends up popping the Zet, leading to both of them getting fired by the mayor. You want us to start thinking? Well, here's a thought. You're fired! <sighs> he even kicks Drex out because he's only a temporary pill, so he goes to flush himself out of Frank's urinary tract. That's kind of dark, actually. Does that mean all these people are just sailing away to their doom? And look, someone's carrying a Pikachu. Does that mean Frank actually ingested a plastic Pokemon toy? Weird. <laughs> While Ozzy convinces Drex to stick around, Thrax breaks into Frank's brain, steals the bead, and turns up the heat. He tries to escape into Frank's subconscious, where all these bizarre dreams are taking place, which is pretty trippy. Maybe if, if you and Mom listen to me a little more, you took better care of yourselves, maybe you should be here. I do like that Thrax is actually freaked out by this, though, which gives him a bit more personality. This cat was sick before I even got here. By the time Ozzy and Drex are partners again, it's too late, as Thrax has kidnapped Leah and escapes looking like the coolest germ in the world. If you follow me, she dies. This leads to a big chase scene that has this catchy techno track playing in the background, which for the life of me I still can't identify to this day. What's this song actually called? It's in the trailer for the movie as well, and it even has lyrics. Someone needs to find the answer here. While our heroes chase down Thrax, things are going south for Frank, who passes out in the car and ends up in hospital, forcing his daughter to slowly watch him die. Daddy, no, I don't want to lose you! How sweet. Drax tries to fly out through a sneeze, but Ozzy is flexible enough to squeeze inside Drax's gun and gets shot straight into the eye of Thrank's daughter. You got us, Moses. Uh -oh! big fight scene. <laughs> After the obligatory early 2000s Matrix parody and a family-friendly strangulation, they end up on a false eyelash where Ozzy baits Thrax into stabbing him and splits himself so he can get away, sealing Thrax's fate and leading to probably one of my all-time favorite villain deaths. <laughs> Ooh, that's what I'm talking about. I know Disney films are renowned for their great falling villain deaths, but this isn't just falling, this is falling and disintegrating into nothingness at the same time. That's how you kill a bad guy. Still, even without Drax, it looks like time might be up for Frank, but Ozzy manages to escape in one of his daughter's tears and makes it back safe. Frank is restored to normal, his daughter avoids psychological trauma, I think, and Ozzy and Drax are celebrated as heroes. Oh, and the mayor presses the wrong button and gets sucked out of Frank's backside. Hmm. I wonder what this does. Hmm. Oh. Not as good as melting away, but you can't win them all. But was that the end for this short-lived idea? Well, surprisingly, no, since barely even a year later, a spin-off show debuted on Cartoon Network called Ozzy and Drix, or as one of my friends once remembered it, Drizzy and Ox. Unlike the movie, this show was fully animated, and ran for two seasons from 2002 to 2004. Personally, I used to watch it all the time, so we just have to give this a quick look. Okay, so apparently Frank learned absolutely nothing from almost dying in the movie, since he's back to his old ways, and Ozzy and Drix end up getting sucked out of Frank and into the body of a teenage boy called Hector, where they now have to contend with a female cop and a spoiled brat mayor who gets everything he wants. Hey Jones, do you have tickets to the show? Well, no, uh, good. 
Also, their voice actors were replaced, so now Phil Lamar is Ozzy and Jeff Bennett is Drix. Yo, Drix! How am I supposed to play catch with your dopey dog if you won't let go? I think Dander expects you to do the catching. Hmm. Actually, you can tell putting these two characters inside a teenage body was something of an attempt to fit in youth messages. Like, I think the episode I remember best is the smoking one. A pair of shady kids who look like they just escaped from the 1980s convince Hector to take a drag on a cigarette, which sends an evil creature named Nicotine into his system, voiced by, who else, Tim Curry. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, but there's been a little change in the program. I'll be sitting in with the band. He's pretty cool because he spreads nicotine addiction by digging his claws into your brain and turning you into a cigar-sucking zombie. So of course it's up to Ozzy and Drex to save the day and return everyone to normal before Hector starts smoking 40 a day. So don't smoke kids, or one day your body might turn into an early 2000s cartoon plot. Anyway, once the show ended in 2004, that was pretty much it for Osmosis Jones, and now it's just another animation obscurity. It's definitely been fun to look back on though, even if all this talk of germs has left me feeling a little achoo, under the weather. Thanks for watching this video, and look out for more trailer reels <coughs> coming soon. Are you enjoying the series? Do you have any thoughts? What tips would you like to see covered next? Let me know in the comments. Remember, you can vote for upcoming episodes in the community tab, and please like and subscribe to the Back to the Past YouTube channel for more outdated content coming soon. Ah, oh, the pleasure center.